Have you got some sort of hard to replace broken plastic item from around your house? Today, we're gonna to fix that quickly and easily with a step-by-step -step guide to measuring, modeling, and 3D printing a working replacement. printing is tremendously versatile, whether it be decorative prints either for show or for storage, or my favourites when I design custom parts to meet a need where no off-the-shelf product is available. Another area where 3D printers are hard to beat is when you have some sort of broken plastic item from around your house that renders the rest of that product completely useless. This busted clip from inside an IKEA wardrobe is an example of that and I could head into store or browse the website to try and find the replacement part, or since I have a 3D printer, I can model up my own and have it fixed really quickly. If you've wanted to attempt projects like this, but didn't know how to approach the workflow and design, this video should guide you step-by-step -step through from measuring, modeling, as well as printing and testing the final part. Let's get into it. Let's start with a summary of the problem. One day, we opened my son's wardrobe and the rail had fallen down, along with all of the clothes that were meant to be hanging up. Looking above, we could see that the retaining clip on one side looked exactly as it should, but on the other side, not so much. I started by unscrewing and removing the broken clip, as well as the good one, as I needed a complete part to take measurements from. The original part is injection molded plastic, and a failure like this should be rare because they have uniform strength throughout the part. But for whatever reason, this part has failed. The other thing that I removed was the actual rail for the wardrobe. Doing so revealed that it had a hole in one end, and that was used to clip into the fitting, which along with a sprung retainer, formed the basis of its function. Our tool of choice for a job like this is a set of vernier or digital calipers. They're quite affordable and can be used in three different ways. Firstly, we can measure the exterior dimensions of an object. We can also measure internal distances. And a less common use is using the tail to measure heights. In this video, you'll see me using the CAD software on shape. I've been using it for many years now because it's free and easy to use. In fact, some of my earliest videos on the channel were building up a playlist for beginners. I'm well aware that something like Fusion 360 is a lot more popular and the best solution is the one that works for you. And I'm approaching this guide from the point of view of making up a complex object with simple parts. So you should be able to follow along using whatever CAD package that you like. Here's a preview of the finished model, but like the horse drawing we just looked at, I'd like to break this down into the various components. For most of the object, I'm gonna use a single sketch and that'll let me create the majority of the shape using simple extrusions and then some fillets to tidy things up. I'll then turn my attention to sketching out the shape of the finger that locks the pole in place before extruding it as a separate object, cutting the rounded sweep from the side and joining the pieces together. I'll then add the little bump that locks the pole in place before turning my attention to the underside to hollow out the shape and create the room required for it to flex. My philosophy when sketching in CAD is to start with basic shapes and then use dimensions as well as relations to refine them. Here I drew two circles, match their diameter, and then use alignment to get the vertical lines that join them on the sides. Don't worry about drawing extra lines and arcs because you can always use a trim tool to clean them up afterwards. Another thing I'm a fan of is using construction lines throughout my sketches. They're quite often handy to keep things symmetrical. You can see when I move one point that everything else is constrained to follow. Now that I have a shape in the correct proportion, I can start to use the dimension tool to get everything accurate. This is where I'll be using my calipers on the real life object, entering the values, and if something goes wrong, like you're about to see here, it means double checking. In this case, I entered a diameter instead of a radius. I like to get as many features out of a single sketch as possible. It makes it far easier to edit the shape later on. In this case, this single sketch is going to get me all three extrusions required for the basic shape. Some things like the positioning of these two circles is quite hard to measure. So I'm going to get it as close as I can. And then I'm going to show you a tip to make sure everything is accurate. 
there's still a lot more we can get into this sketch. And next up is the circular shape which holds the rod. Along with the two screw holes, this is probably the most important shape to get correct. There's a tricky section which extends downwards out from these circles. I'm just going to eyeball it for now. Again, we're going to make it accurate later on. Almost all 2D sketches can be made from straight lines, circles and arcs, with this being no exception. Again, I'm using mirrors here to make sure all of my geometry matches. It's going to ensure that my part is accurate, as well as taking less time to model. Some of these distances are really easy to measure with calipers, and other ones not so much. Fortunately, most CAD software will let us drag anything unconstrained into a better position. As you dimension geometry that is hard to measure in real life, use trial and error until it's visually quite similar, and then drag parts into position to get it closer still. As long as we have our critical dimensions and those that we can measure easily with the calipers, our final shape should have the desired accuracy. One final tweak of that radius and everything matches real life. Now before I go any further, I'm going to make a really simplified footprint of this and 3D print that and then I can hold it up against the original part and verify that my dimensions are accurate enough to continue. To do this, I'm going to do a series of thin extrusions, much thinner than the part is in real life. The aim is to have a first prototype that's really quick to print. The final thickness doesn't matter at all. All that matters is that I can hold up this part against the original one and see if the two match. I chose to print this on my Prusa Mini and that's why I purchased it, to have it sitting next to me on my desk to do small prints conveniently and quickly. It took about 28 minutes to print this little test one and the dimensions seem spot on. The exterior matches perfectly. If we rotate and align, we can see the holes are spot on too. One that's more difficult to work out is whether the rod holder is in the right place, but it looks very close and I think we're safe to continue. Now that our geometry is verified, we can come back, edit the extrusions and put in the correct heights. Our part is taking shape overall, so we'll match the real life object and come in and put some fillets. I don't actually try to measure anything here, I just do it so it looks visually similar. Let's move on to our next part, which is the cutout and raised finger section. Again, I'm trying to get as much as I can into a single sketch. On shape, like most CAD programs, has a trace function where you can click on existing geometry and that'll give you something to snap to. Just like last time, we're going to use the same philosophy. We're going to use simple shapes to draw all of our basic geometry and then add dimensions and other details until everything is accurate. Again, we're not worried if we have too many lines because we can easily trim the excess before mirroring to the other side. We continue adding in features bit by bit, just using arcs, straight lines and circles. For things I can measure, I'll dimension accurately. For anything else, close enough is good enough in most cases. Now we can put our sketch to use, starting with cutting out the finger. Now the next extrusion is slightly unusual in that I don't merge it with the rest of the geometry. Instead, I do it as its own completely new shape. The reason for that is that I can hide the original shape, which gives me good visibility when drawing the sketch I need to cut the curve I need for the top of this finger section without affecting the geometry of the rest of the part. Afterwards, you simply do a Boolean union to join the parts back together before some more chamfers and fillets to get it looking like the real life part. Next up, we do a simple 2D sketch and then an extrusion to create the little boss that holds the pole in place. We add a specific feature suited for 3D printing, which is putting a chamfer to prevent an overhang. We once again add fillets, just putting in a radius that suits what we see in real life rather than trying to be overly accurate. Now here's the part where I had a failure, except it wasn't a printer failure. Instead, my inability to double check by looking underneath the original part, where I would have noticed I was missing a cutout for the finger. I started an extra sketch on the bottom of the part and traced all of the existing geometry before adding a simple straight line to make an enclosed section where I could do an extruded cut. To smooth out the step on the underside, I added a chamfer and then a fillet to get a nice transition. There was a section that would require support when printing, but it would be completely hidden on the final model. Joined back up my components and I was completely done. Since I was using the Prusa Mini, I decided to use Prusa Slicer. The inbuilt profiles make this pretty easy. The only two things of note I've done here, I turn up the infill to 30% for some strength 
and turn on support, which you can see working on the underside of the raised section. Prusa Slicer did a good job with the support because it was pretty easy to poke out of the way, first loosening it from the top and then sliding in a tool underneath. In about 30 seconds, all of the support material had been removed. Comparing the flexible finger from the new design to the old, it seemed pretty much spot on. A quick test fit before screwing it into the wardrobe is advised. In this case, it passed with flying colours. That meant going back to the Prusa Mini and printing number 2. I also wanted to experiment with printing some of these brackets using a resin printer. The good news being that I could position all of the support on the underside where it wouldn't be seen. I removed the support material after washing, but before post curing, this means everything was soft and it peeled off easily. As you can see, the surface finish is so good, you can see the polygons that make up the STL. In this state, it was a little bit soft however, so I put it in the post curing machine and headed out to the garage where I could put it on the linisher to get rid of the dimples left behind by the support underneath. That left a good surface, so all we had to do was test fit. The part survived the tightening of the screws and then I was able to clip in the rod with a satisfying click. And that was extra satisfying because I had created the part myself. It seemed plenty strong but the real test was hanging all of the clothes back up which it passed with flying colours. Unless you get close, you can't tell that it's ready printed. Next up was the resin version, it too screwed into place and once again the rod snapped into position. Some resins are quite brittle, but this frozen ABS-like resin is quite strong and was easily robust enough for this task. A successful project, and all that remains is to give my part a Swedish name. I've pulled these off just to film this segment, but I'm pleased to report that both versions work extremely well. And if for any reason in future that they fail, it's going to be an easy fix because I have a CAD file and I can add some thickness or a support rib as necessary. If you were unsure about attempting a project like this, maybe this video could have given you the encouragement you needed to have a crack. If you've already done a project like this in the past, please leave your most useful 3D print down below in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.